The purpose of this video is to show you an example of convolving rectangular pulses. This example is in almost every textbook I've ever seen. At least some variation of it is. It will help you figure out how convolution works, but is not particularly used in real world problems. So the example is this. We have a pulse x of t that has amplitude 1 from 0 to 1 and is 0 elsewhere. We have a second pulse h of t of duration 3 and amplitude 1. Before actually computing the convolution, let's look at the steps that it involves. Here is a convolution integral of x of t convolved with h of t. To get this convolution for the specific time t, in principle, we need to look at the whole lengths of x and h from minus infinity to infinity. To do this, we define a variable of integration tau. Tau will go from minus infinity to infinity in this integral and will cover the entire lengths of x and h. And t will be fixed at a given time for the integral. So step one is to flip and shift h of tau. The t minus tau in h of tau has the effect on the tau axis of flipping or mirroring h about the value tau is equal to zero and then shifting right by t. Step two is to multiply the two signals together. So you multiply x of tau by h of t minus tau. Step three is to integrate the product of x and h, which essentially involves getting the area under the product. These steps are then repeated for various values of t. Now in principle, you could do this for every possible value of t, but this would take quite a while. In practice, you look for the values of t that are going to change the basic structure of your integral. So to show how this works, let's choose a particular value of t and then go back to our two signals and begin by graphing x of tau. We'll do this because we want to lay on top of it a flipped and shifted version of h. And as a reminder, tau here is the variable of integration. So we take h, we flip it about the line tau is equal to zero, and it looks like this. For values of tau from minus three to zero, it has a magnitude of one, and it's zero for all the other values of tau. When we plug in the t, that shifts h of minus tau to wherever t is. So let's suppose that for the sake of argument, we choose a value of t is equal to 1 half, and I chose this sort of randomly. So h of t minus tau gets shifted. The point here at tau is equal to 0 will get shifted to 1 half, and the point here at minus 3 gets mapped to minus 3 plus 1 half, which is minus 2 and 1 half. So for this value of t, which is 1 half, h of t minus tau looks like this. Now again, I've chosen the value of 1 half for t fairly arbitrarily, and in a minute we'll talk about how you go about choosing reasonable values for t. So let's look at what we get when we do this convolution. When we multiply x of tau and h of t minus tau, in this region, for every value of tau less than 0, x of tau is 0. And so the product of x of tau and h of t minus tau is also 0. Similarly, for values of tau greater than 1 half, h of t minus tau is 0, so their product will be 0. So for values of tau between 0 and 1 half, both of these signals have a value of 1, so their product will also be 1. If we go back to our list of things to do, we've completed step 2, that is, we've multiplied the two signals. Step 3 is to integrate. And again, integration is finding the area, in this case, the area under the product of x of tau and h of t minus tau. The width of this rectangular area is 1 half, and the height is 1. So for the value of t equals 1 half, x of t convolved with h of t is 1 half. So that basically shows us the convolution for one particular value of t. And the question is, in general, how do we figure out how many different values of t we need to look at in order to compute the complete convolution? 
Let's start again with x of tau and h of minus tau, which is h flipped about the point tau is equal to zero. Let's see what happens when t is negative. h of t minus tau is shifted to the left. So this point is shifted to t, which is negative, and this point is shifted to t minus three, which is even farther to the left. x of tau is non-zero for tau between zero and one, my h is shifted so far to the left that the non-zero parts of x and h don't overlap. So basically, whenever h is non-zero, x is zero, and whenever x is non-zero, the flipped and shifted h is zero. So we get the product is zero everywhere, and the integral of a function that is zero everywhere is zero. So we have learned that if t is less than zero, the convolution is equal to zero. So that's a useful result. In fact, we've already finished half the real line by looking at the case where t is negative. Sadly, that's not half the problem. Okay, so now the question is, are there other values of t for which the convolution is zero? We know that when the non-zero part of x does not overlap the non-zero part of the flipped and shifted h, the convolution is zero. So let's look at choosing t so that our picture looks like this. This can get a little tricky. You must make sure that you correctly label this point here. The time of zero has been shifted to t, so that means that this point will be t minus three. Hopefully it is obvious that the non-zero part of x does not overlap the non-zero part of our flipped and shifted h. This is true if I choose t to be big enough. So the product will be zero, and the integral of the product will be zero. So now we figured out another case where x convolved with h is zero. And what values of t will this hold for? Well, this edge of h and this edge of x must not overlap. This edge is at t minus three, and this edge is at one. So our result holds if t minus three is greater than one, and I can solve this to be t greater than four. So we know what happens when the non-zero parts of h and x don't overlap, what happens when they do. So let's try putting the right side of our flipped and shifted h to the right of the right edge of x, and the left edge of our flipped and shifted h to the left of x. So now we've got something that looks like this. The edges of h have been moved like this. This point is t. This point is t minus three. Where is this product non-zero? Everywhere that x is zero, the product will be zero. So that is everything except tau between zero and one. Between zero and one, the product of x and the flipped and shifted h is one. So I need to find the area under this rectangle. This rectangle has a base of width one and a height of one, so the area of this rectangle is one. So that means that for this value of t, x convolved with h is one. And so the next question is, for what values of t is our picture correct? In other words, for what values of t will the convolution be one? Here at t, in order for the right edge of the shifted and flipped h to be to the right of the right edge of t, we need to have t be greater than one. For the left edge of h to be on the left of the left edge of x, we need t minus three to be less than zero. And so we can work this out to get that t is less than three. So we combine these two results, and we have that t is between one and three. So when this is true, that means that the convolution of x and h is one. So we'll update our list of results by adding the case where one is less than t, which is less than three. So now we know what happens when t is less than zero. We know what happens when t is greater than four and we know what happens when t is between one and three. So all we have left is what happens when t is between zero and one, and what happens when t is between three and four. 
So let's look at what happens when t is between 0 and 1. I've redrawn x of tau. Now we assume that t is between 0 and 1. That means h is going to look something like this. It goes out to t minus 3. Again, this is our h of t minus tau for t between 0 and 1. This guy has been moved to t, and this guy has been moved to t minus 3. Clearly, where x is equal to 0, the product of x and h will be 0, and that happens for all these values of tau less than 0 and up to here. h is 0 for values of tau greater than t. The product of x and h now looks something like this. The area under this thing is the product of the height, which is 1, and the width of the base, which is t. So the area will be t. This holds for any values of t between 0 and 1. The picture is essentially the same. So if I make t bigger, then the area increases. If I make t smaller, then the area decreases. So between 0 and 1, x convolved with h is equal to t. The last condition that we haven't looked at is when t is between 3 and 4. So let's take our shifted and flipped version of h and move it out here so t is less than 4 and greater than 3. This edge moves here. Then drawing h of t minus tau, the left edge of h is at t minus 3. Since t is between 3 and 4, t minus 3 falls between 0 and 1. Everywhere that x or h is 0, the product is 0. So the only place the product is not 0 is right here, t minus 3 to 1. So I have an area with a width of 1 minus t minus 3 and a height of 1. So I can do a little bit of algebra here and multiply the width by the height, which is 1, and get that this is equal to 4 minus t. Now this picture holds whenever t is between 3 and 4. So for t between 3 and 4, the convolution is 4 minus t. So, in some sense you can say we're done, although it can never be done enough. And the last thing I'd like to do is draw the convolved h and x and see what it looks like and see if we can come to any more general conclusions. Okay, so to draw it, for values of t less than 0, x convolved with h is 0. Between 0 and 1, the convolution is t, so it begins at 0 and has a slope of 1. For t between 1 and 3, the convolution is just equal to 1. For t between 3 and 4, I have 4 minus t. When t is equal to 3, 4 minus t gives me 1. And when t is equal to 4, 4 minus 4 gives me 0. So it ends up being a line that goes down with slope negative 1. Finally, when t is greater than 4, we have 0 again. So this is the convolution of two rectangular pulses. This is a pattern that always happens if you convolve two rectangular pulses. The result has two sloping lines, like this, and a flat spot. The flat spot has a width of 2 because h is 2 seconds wider than x. When you are convolving two rectangular pulses, you're going to get a flat spot that is the difference between the width of the two pulses. The exception to this is if your pulses are exactly the same width, you have no flat spot. Now, the slope of the line up and the slope of the line down depend on the amplitude of the two pulses. In our case, since the amplitude of both pulses is 1, the line here has a slope of positive 1, and this line has a slope of negative 1. If I had had different amplitudes for either x or h or both, the slopes of these lines would be different, and the height of the flat spot would be different. So that pretty much wraps up the uh, video. Hopefully you found this useful, and thanks for watching.